Well, I want to welcome everybody uh, to the 2011 AMDA IPA Pompeii Patient and Scientific Conference. It's been, you know, about five years since we've done one of these, and I'm really looking forward to the agenda, and I hope that everybody else is too. I want to give a special thanks to all of our speakers who've come so far and put so much time into their presentations. They're all very, very busy, de dedicated people, and I'd like to give them a round of applause. You know, in the Pompeii field, I think we're extremely lucky to have so many dedicated people working so very hard for us, and that's something that we all need to, I think, keep in mind and remember. Um, I also want to thank all the patients who've come this far. I know it's not easy. I know seven was an early time to start, or eight for right now, but thank you for bearing with us. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to the Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Arnold Ruser, and let us get started. Okay, did you official? <laughs> Is it like a wedding ceremony? <laughs> I'm the master of the ceremony. And of course, the purpose of this meeting is that at the end, we will all be extremely excited because all of us, we have invested. I've been traveling from Europe and uh, I was almost forgotten <laughs> how much time it takes. Uh, but we here, immediately, you know, it's all gone because you're here. It's the same, I realize, for, for, for patients uh, coming from the United States because in Europe we are all small, very close together. You travel short distances. It's not too much of a hassle to be here, but for you to go on the plane with uh, a ventilator or whatever, it's, it is an investment. So we want to get out the best. And also for the industry people, they came all the way, uh, they keep helping us, and us is us. Uh, I forgot the technology. Um, it will be run in a very loosely way. If anything goes wrong, you just raise your voice and say, I don't like this, I love that, like that, we, we're going to do it better. That, that's the style of the AMDA. No formalities. Um, so it's our meeting, and uh, I think we'll start. Just a few, few uh, that was it. Thanks to the AMDA for organizing it. Uh, that was not my part. Uh, so I'll announce the, um, the first speaker. And the first speaker is... Um, Kevin O'Donnell, uh, maybe he, to your surprise, he is a plant <laughs> geneticist. And he works on plant diseases. And uh, I met him uh, the first time, I think it was about 20 years ago, Kevin, that we met, uh, probably on the phone, although email did exist in those days. <laughs> maybe it was a fax machine. Anyhow, uh, when, when we really matched uh, met person to person, was at the central station at Rotterdam, where I'm living, and uh, Kevin was there with his wife, Eline, and uh, we had a very pleasant uh, dinner at my home with my wife, and um, at, the, at the end, yeah, something had really happened, but that, that evening I will never uh, forget. Uh, Kevin, it's, it's for you to tell the story about Pomfret disease. Please take the phone. Uh, thank you, Arnold, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. It's a genuine pleasure and a privilege to be here. It really is. Uh, as, as Arnold alluded to, uh, I'm a scientist, but my... Uh, my field is not Pompey. My involvement was as a parent. Uh, our first child was diagnosed with uh, infantile Pompey disease and, uh, and died. There was no treatment at that time. Uh, that was back in 1993. Uh, so uh, my involvement was as a parent. Uh, I'm actually here as a historian. Something wrong with the sound. Oh. Uh, can any, anyone hear? No. 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 Oh, maybe, maybe I'm not standing close enough, is that better? Does that help? Yeah. Okay, right. I will very briefly recap the last 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm a scientist, my involvement is not as a scientist, it was a parent, and I'm, I'm here today as a historian. And you may ask, uh, you're at this conference to hear the very latest 
in developments in Pompey disease, why are we starting with a, a history lecture? Um, well, two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, it is a fantastic story, and it's one that um, I hope I can do justice. Actually, I've realized I'd better start up my talk. Hold on. Yeah, so it's a fantastic story, and it's one that I hope I can do justice to. Every one of those little tiles there, which I'd love to say is uh, very, very carefully put together, but in fact is uh, in large part what I had on my hard disk at the time, every one of those is a story in itself. Secondly, though, the second reason this, that history is important is that this is a work in progress. We've come a long way towards a treatment for Pompe disease. We've still got a way to go. And in order to continue to progress, it's important that we have a shared understanding of how we got where we are today and the roles played by uh, scientists and doctors, by industry, and by patients. If we have a common knowledge of how we got where we are today, that is uh, both a guide to our understanding of the present and a tool that we can use to shape the future. And every one of you here today is going to be involved in making that future. Okay, so what I'm going to cover. Uh, the milestones in our understanding of Pompe disease, the development of enzyme replacement therapy, uh, this isn't put in a particularly um, elegant way, but the industrialization of enzyme replacement therapy, how it came to be a medicine on the market, and I'm also going to say a little bit about the Pompe model which I think is, is quite an important thing. Okay, so we start here. The story starts with J.C. Pompey, or Pompa, as he himself would have pronounced it, the man who discovered Pompey disease back in 1930. Uh, he was a pathologist in Utrecht. He uh, was investigating the, the death of a young girl. And he found in the muscle tissue uh, an accumulation which because he had colleagues who had been involved in working in the first glycogen storage disease, he had the idea that this might be a glycogen storage disease. And indeed, that's what turned out to be the case. He continued his work and eventually published a, a thesis on the subject in 1936. So a disease that had been around for millions of years, first discovered by J.C. Pompey in 1930. And he went on to work as a pathologist in the hospital uh, in Amsterdam. Now, it's impossible to talk about J.C. Pompey and his discoveries without saying a little bit about uh, the course of the rest of his life. Um, he was not only a scientist, he, he was also a hero. Following the, the Nazi invasion of the Netherlands in 1940, he started working with the Dutch resistance. Uh, he was involved in helping to hide Jews from the Nazis. And then, because his laboratory was quite isolated from the rest of the hospital, he volunteered to host a transmitter that was used by the resistance to send messages to the Allies. Uh, the, the transmitter was eventually discovered in 1945. Uh, the hospital was raided. One of his colleagues was shot uh, in the courtyard of the hospital. Pompey himself uh, had been at Mass that day, it was a Sunday, and heard about the raid. He ran home to tell his wife and children that he would be going into hiding. And at that point, unfortunately, uh, he was caught and arrested and dragged off from his wife and children at gunpoint. Um, uh, uh, a couple of months later, he was part of a group of 20 people who were shot in a mass execution in retaliation for some uh, resistance activities. So why do I mention this? Because I, I think bravery like that deserves to be remembered. And I think we should all um, take, a, take a certain pride in the fact that this disease with which we're all associated in some way has been named after such a remarkable man. 
Yeah, and unless somebody comes up with a Mother Teresa disease, I think we're ahead of the game. <laughs> now, I often like to make the, the point that the baddies in this story are uh, Nazis, not Germans. Um, and I've made the point in the past that the, the Germans were the first victims of the Nazis. Uh, millions of Germans were arrested, tens of thousands executed for opposing the regime. I'd like to make that point again in a slightly different way. And this, I've called this a digression. It's actually a pseudo digression, as I shall explain. The guy, when I first saw this picture, uh, I thought it was a film set. This is, uh, although the layout looks like a Nuremberg rally, uh, you see the Union Jack and the, the lightning symbol. This dot up here is this guy, Sir Oswald Mosley. So Oswald Mosley, a British aristocrat, head of the British Union of Fascists and National Socialists. He is speaking at the largest political rally, ever indoor political rally, ever held in the United Kingdom, a record that stands to this day. Now, the astonishing thing here for me is the date, okay? This remarkable show of force took place on the 16th of the July, 1939, six weeks before the start of the Second World War in London, okay? Now, the reason I say this, uh, partly is a nod towards my German friends, also because history, we, we tend to assume that because things have happened in a certain way, there was some kind of inevitability about it. Not, not so. History sometimes, hangs by a thread and it depends on the right people doing the right things at the right time and as we will see as we go through the Pompey story the same applies to us. Okay the next stage in our story Pompey had discovered the disease he'd left us something of a mystery uh, because as we found out more about uh, glycogen metabolism it appeared that the enzymes responsible for the normal metabolism of glycogen into sugar were present in people with Pompe disease. And yet, there was still obviously a missing enzyme because there was this glycogen accumulation. Christian de Duve uh, was actually working on insulin. He, he, not working on glycogen storage diseases at all, working on insulin. Um, came across in his laboratory these things called lysosomes which uh, formed the path of the rest of his career. These little cellular compartments with an acid environment that are involved in recycling components. And uh, de Duve went on to work on that for the rest of his career. He won the Nobel Prize for that discovery in 1974. He had no idea of any medical application of his discovery. He was simply interested in pushing back the frontiers of our knowledge and understanding. So he went on to work in lysosomes. Uh, one of his colleagues, Harry Hers, decided to continue to work on, on carbohydrate metabolism. He went off and did his own thing with his own team. And he was, um, eventually took an interest in the glycogen storage diseases. And he was trying to uh, find an assay for the enzyme that's missing in glycogen storage disease type three. And he, he failed to do that. What he found instead was uh, an enzyme that seemed to work at an acid pH. And then he made the connection. What if this is a missing enzyme in Pompey disease? What if, because it works at an acid pH, it's a lysosomal enzyme? It's an enzyme that's supposed to work in the lysosomes. Wouldn't the consequences of such missing enzymes be that we'd have lysosomal storage? And in fact, on investigation, that turned out to be the case. Uh, Harry Hairs discovered lysosomal storage diseases, 1965. Um, possibly the only man in the world who could have made those different connections because of his history. Now, the right person at the right time doing the right things. But that, so we discovered Pompey disease. Uh, it was now understood but they've followed a quarter of a century of sometimes pretty desperate attempts to treat Pompey disease, completely without success. All that changes in 1991. 
Arnold Breusser and Anne's van der Plug. I think Anne's at the time was a PhD student uh, and uh, Arnold was a supervisor. In these photos showing the traditional split in activity between supervisor and PhD student. Uh, student doing the work, supervisor in the bar. Uh, a story that will be familiar to many of us. Now, they, they did the background of scientific knowledge had progressed. We knew a bit more about the working of lysosomes and receptors on cells and so on. Arnold and Anse had the idea that if you had enzyme that was phosphorylated, that had a, a mannose 6-phosphate residue on it, this might get into the muscle cells and into the lysosomes. That, uh, so they took what was then the deeply unfashionable idea of enzyme replacement therapy, applied it to uh, the deeply unfashionable Pompe disease, a disease many people weren't that interested in, and they published a, a remarkable series of papers that uh, ended in 1991 with one entitled, and uh, I've got this written down so I get it absolutely right, intravenous administration of phosphorylated acid alpha glucosidase leads to uptake of enzyme in heart and skeletal muscle of mice. Now what does that mean? It means that they'd found a way to get the missing enzyme into the muscle cells where it needed to go. That paper is available online, it's free, print it out. Every one of you should have a copy of this. And the reason it's so important is because after over 60 years in our knowledge of Pompe disease, this is the moment where hope is born. This was truly the turning of the tide in terms of how we went about getting a treatment for this disease. Once again, the right people doing the right things at the right time. One other thing that laboratory did, they cloned the gene for the enzyme. Now that's fantastic. If you've got the gene, uh, you can then use it to do all sorts of things, including constructing cell lines that produce the missing enzyme for you. So, we are halfway through this narrative, and I'm, I think about halfway through the time, so that's good. I just want to recap. 1930, Pompey discovers the disease. 1965, Hers explains the disease. 91, Reusser and van der Plug demonstrate how we could have a treatment, the birth of hope. The next question was, how did we get from the laboratory to a treatment? Now in the early 90s, that was something that was concentrating the minds of many of us. It, was, um, you know, it coincided with the birth of the internet. There were patient groups uh, beginning to get in touch with each other in different countries. But it seemed a, an insurmountable obstacle. We knew what had to be done. We knew from the papers, here was the treatment. How did we get uh, industry interested and make that into a medicine that could be used to treat patients? Something had to change at that point. And fortunately, the change makers came along. The House family, following uh, Tiffany's diagnosis, founded the Acid Maltase Deficiency Association and then were like a, a force of nature blowing through the, the whole Pompey world for the first time. For the first time, they got all the scientists gathered together. Everybody in the world working on Pompey disease got them together in the same room. In many cases, it was the first time these people had met. Got them together in the same room and got them talking to each other. And they did it again and again. They invested in research. Uh, the EMDA are responsible for millions going into Pompey research. But more than that, they brought, brought energy and vision, absolutely relentless energy and vision, concentrated on making things happen. Uh, any company that expressed any interest in Pompey disease would have had Randall on their doorstep the next morning telling them what they had to be doing. <laughs> Above all else, the House family were team players. It would have been understandable, I guess, if they'd said, you know what, we've done all this. We know what we want to do. We don't actually need you guys in, in Europe or Australia or wherever. But they didn't do that. They shared 
They brought everybody into the fold, and we ended up, uh, as I'll show in a moment, with the International Pompeii Association. We all ended up being greater than the sum of their parts, and that uh, the absolute key to that happening was the generosity of the houses. What we ended up with is what we now call the Pompeii model of patients, scientists and industry working together for a common goal. We all take that for granted. Here we all are in the same room. Uh, we shouldn't do it. It only happened. This has only happened because people created it that way. It didn't happen by accident. Okay. 1999, a community comes of age. That was the first first of these meetings like this one today, where we had um, the, the meetings uh, Rando and Marlon had organized before were primarily scientific meetings, though I, I was invited along to the one in 98. In 1999, we all came together in the Netherlands to found the International Pompey Association. So this was representatives from different countries, uh, the leading scientists and industry representatives as well. It's a very exciting time, particularly because <coughs> We already knew at that point that clinical trials were beginning to start. The team in Rotterdam, um, who uh, originally developed enzyme replacement therapy, were working with a company called Farming. There was also a trial at Duke University in, um, with a company called Synpac under the leadership of Y.T. Chen. Uh, to give him his full title, uh, the legendary Y.T. Chen, who's uh, famous for his interest in the whole range of glycogen storage diseases. If you ask any patient with glycogen storage disease to name one scientist, it would probably be Y.T. Chen. We began to get successful results uh, coming through uh, in 2000, first with the Rotterdam trial, then with the Duke trial. Things now get a bit confusing. Okay? So we have three companies involved. We have Farming, we have Genzyme, we have Synpac. If this, was a, if this was a movie, an old movie of the kind that I like to watch, uh, and by the way, for those of you with teenagers, uh, if you want them out the room so you can have some time with your partner, put on a black and white film. It's, it's like kryptonite. <laughs> they, they, they assume the TV's broken and they go. So, imagine such a film. The scene is always like this. You know, the people go into the room, the bedroom door, slowly closes. Uh, it fades to black and then it's the next morning. So imagine that in your mind if you will and uh, in the next morning Genzyme own everything. So Genzyme are now the one company involved in all of this. And um, okay there's a lot of ins and outs there and I'm skating over a few things but there, there was a lot of positive things from that. We now had one company to deal with who are absolutely committed to building on these successful clinical trials and bringing enzyme replacement therapy to market. And then uh, things took a bit of a wrong turn. Uh, we had uh, the Novazyme diversion, which sounds like an episode of Star Trek, <laughs> but unfortunately is not. This, um, this was a company um, set up by John Crowley and uh, Randall and I went to visit them at their headquarters in Oklahoma and we were shown lots of slides like this, pages and pages of them that all looked like this. Now on the left hand what we have is Pompey Mouse Muscle, I think they got Pompey Mice from Nina Rabin. Uh, Pompey Mouse Muscle treated with the enzyme used in the clinical trials, so phosphorylated enzyme and uh, after six hours they killed the mice and stained the muscle cells. And as you can see, they're pink, and the pink is glycogen. So not surprisingly, after six hours, lots of glycogen there. On the right-hand side, right, these are the same type of mice treated after six hours, uh, after six hours after being treated with a Novozyme product. And as you can see, there is no glycogen there. Now, we were absolutely astonished by this. Uh, this, um, it all sounded too good to be true, in fact, but there was the evidence. And uh, John Crowley's a very admirable, very engaging guy, he's one of us. So uh, this, this just seemed fantastic. Unfortunately, the old adage holds true, 
that if something seems too good to be true, uh, it probably is too good to be true. I have a question that's mainly directed at Nina Rabin, but could uh, be usefully answered by the, the, the whole panel, I think, and perhaps also Bill Canfield, who's, who's in the hall. Um, Nina, you mentioned in your talk the, the difficulties of getting glycogen out of skeletal muscle using enzyme replacement therapy, and questioned whether a, sorry, shall I stand up, and questioned whether a, a different approach might be necessary. Now, two or three years ago, I think it was, Randall House and I visited Novozyme, and they presented us some results, which I think used your mouse model, which showed glycogen being completely cleared out of skeletal muscle within 60 minutes. Uh, was that the sort of alternative approach you had in mind? I think you should address this question to Novozyme people. <laughs> Is there any questions? Yeah, um, I think those results are basically an artifact of the fixation process. And um, we didn't understand at the time, I don't think, many people understood that standard fixative was not able to fix glycogen in the tissue. And so on a PAS stain and fixed with formaldehyde or anything other than glutaraldehyde, you lose the glycogen. And it's a highly variable process. Uh, you know, in, in more recent studies with highly phosphorylated GAA preparations, they don't perform significantly differently than the current genzyme preparation. We're trying to understand why that is at this point. Uh, uh, this was uh, the 2003 conference. I asked what had happened to this uh, Novozyme product because Genzyme had bought over $137.5 million. Obviously, uh, where did it go? Crikey, this is a fantastic treatment. Why wasn't it being used now? So, the response I got, and do go and see this on YouTube or wherever, because you should see this for yourself. Bill Canfield, the, the uh, scientist later made famous by Harrison Ford, uh, replied to say that uh, those results that I'd just shown were not repeatable because they'd used the wrong dye. And uh, uh, the slides that looked like they were free of glycogen actually still had lots of glycogen in them, but it had been washed out because they, they'd used the wrong dye and hadn't done it properly. So it didn't work. It simply didn't work. Um, hold on. Yeah, they must have been kicking themselves, I thought, that they didn't use the same technician for the muscle samples on the right-hand side, where they hadn't succeeded in showing the glycogen, as all the samples on the left-hand side where they'd managed to show the glycogen. If only they'd used the same technician for both, that expensive mistake would have been avoided. So, um, 137 million, it didn't work. Um, I'm sure due diligence was followed. Could have happened to anybody, Genzyme. But, <laughs> As you're a company that likes a bargain, and I know there's a lot of Genzyme here, for a mere 13 million, I can offer you this large detached property in the center of Edinburgh. Comes with commanding views of the city, its own battlements, cannon, and so on. And its own military tattoo every year. Um, lots of men in skirts. I believe you've got a French parent company now. The French are mad for men in skirts. And. It comes complete with the royal crown jewels of Scotland. Um, an unmissable bargain, I'm sure you'll agree. $13 million in used small denomination notes. Uh, if you could just leave them in this waste paper bin, which, as you can see, I have clearly marked. And I'll be in touch as soon as I've got them out. Um, seriously, though. Genzyme are one of my favorite companies, and not, partly because they're big enough to take a joke. Uh, they're my favorite company for other reasons, too. Why are they my favorite company? Uh, okay, they're in business to make a profit. Fair enough, all companies are. Um, do they play hardball 
in the pursuit of their aims? Yes, they do. But that aim is to bring treatments to people who don't have them. People nobody else cared much about. And they did it successfully. Once that diversion was out of the way, they knuckled down, they invested huge amounts of money. They had a guy called Frank Collington, uh, an engineer who was responsible for bringing that project to fruition. Ramping up production of the enzyme, uh, they hugely expanded clinical trials, and uh, they got to the stage where there was enough production to meet patient demand. They were the, and the way they did it was to become fully involved in that Pompey model. We have uh, interactions between patient representatives and industry that are very strong and have stood the test of the occasional disagreement. You know, I wouldn't want to pretend everything's lovely and happy and nobody ever disagrees, but the fact is you only know your relationship is strong when you have something to disagree about, and that relationship is strong. So the big picture then for Genzyme is a company who have done the right thing at the right time. In 2006, the end of our journey, they brought myozyme to market. We had the first treatment for Pompe disease available to, to everyone in the world who needed it. Okay, the timeline in conclusion. 1930, Pompe discovers the disease. 65, HERS explains it. 1991, the birth of hope. We have a treatment sketched out. 95 onwards, the houses make things happen. We had clinical trials in 99. and 2006, Genzyme delivered. 2011, who knows what comes next? It's up to you. Now, I wanted to end with a very positive slide. Uh, the reason this slide is so positive is because all these glasses are half full. <laughs> You in this room are the right people to take this forward. All of you here, industry, scientists, patients, because patients are not spectators here, they're participants. You're the right people. This is your time. With history as your guide, what went wrong and what went right, you will do the right things for the future. The future is yours. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much for this fantastic introduction to this weekend. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying uh, on schedule this time. And I apologize for, for the movie. I, I, I don't get it. Anyhow, uh, next speaker, Dr. Paul Plotz. He is a scientist emeritus from NIH. And for 15 years, <coughs> he's been working with Dr. Nina Rabin very actively. And I think uh, at some points, they, they really brought it to a higher level of understanding pompe disease. Uh, it started with genetics, uh, all your mouse models, <coughs> and a Raven who was working with Dr. Plotz. Yeah. And I said, no. Dr. Plotz, well, it's a team, you know. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, if I may express very faint irritation at Kevin for uh, stealing my message about the House family. but. Uh, um, speaking as a scientist who got involved in Pompe disease, uh, I don't know, 17 years ago, Nina, something like that, it, uh, and I was attracted to it because it looked like a disease that was going to be treatable and curable. And, uh, and within, you know, within our lifetimes, it would be treatable and curable. And then uh, along came Randall and Marilyn and Tiffany into our lives 16 years ago. And I think the debt of the scientific community to the House family is enormous. I think it's, I can't speak for the patient community, and I think the same is true for the patient community. But for the science community, it really meant what Kevin said, that uh, they brought us all together. We met people we'd read about and heard about, and some of whom we hadn't heard about and hadn't known about, but but Randall found them, and we had a wonderful first meeting and then a series of other meetings as well. 
Tiffany was a little girl in those days. She's a nice grown woman now. And uh, they have been, the, uh, the family, thoughtful, anticipating what was needed, uh, incredibly hospitable, as you have all experienced. And we owe them an enormous debt. And I just want to reiterate that again. So what I'm going to do uh, is to, to uh, do three things this morning. The first is to briefly tell you what, uh, 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 what strike me uh, as the, the big problems in the treatment of Pompe disease. And oh, yes, I will. Sorry. Yes. Um, Oh, here, no, I've got it. I've got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what I see as the big problems facing Pompe disease treatment, and then I'm going to talk about as what I think the science, com what scientists uh, translate those problems into as problems that we ought to be solving, and then telling you about uh, finally the things that are going on now that are advancing the treatment of Pompe disease. So, uh, start off. You, you may not agree with this, and many of you, particularly patients and their families, will have a different perspective on this and will have added perspectives. And I realize that there are things that I haven't said here which I recognize as problems, but I think are part of the larger problems. Well, one thing is, of course, uh, the obvious very high dose and high cost of enzyme replacement therapy. Another is an uncertainty, really, about where this therapy is going. What, how long will people really need to be on therapy? And uh, 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 how long will they need to be on high doses? And I'm not pointing any fingers anywhere. These are extremely difficult questions to answer. The incomplete skeletal and breathing muscle response in some infants, with even with the earliest forms of th earliest therapy. The uncertain long-term outcome in enzyme replacement therapy in even infants who have been treated very early. The disease that is turning up outside of the muscles with longer infant survival. Central nervous system disease, in some cases, hearing problems, swallowing problems, breathing problems, weak bones and scoliosis, and possibly some late heart disease as well. And then in adults, what appears to be primarily a leveling off rather than a major improvement in, with enzyme replacement therapy in the adult disease, and that uh, being a consequence of the different character of the disease in adults from in children. Now, looking at this in terms, let's see, actually, somehow, I've managed to skip a slide. Use the uh, arrow to go back. Oh, thank you. Did it work? No. It did not. Um, yes. No. Yes. And uh, here. I want to go back to that one. So, this is the translation of this into the view of a of a scientist. 
what do we worry about with respect to the high dose? Well, the re there are some of the reasons for it are that there is a very large mass of muscle. It's one of the largest organs in the body. Maybe it's the largest organ in the body, the muscle mass. The second thing is that a lot of enzyme that's given ends up not in muscle. It ends up in other organs where it is not doing the job that is necessary to do on muscle. Uh, the liver is a big sink for the enzyme. Another problem is that it probable that the amount of the receptor for the enzyme on muscle is lower than it might be. So there may, may not be sufficient receptor on the surface of muscle cells. Another problem is that we don't know what's going on with the lysosomes. Why are they unable to keep up? Why do they burst? Why do they leak, especially in infants? There is dispute about this, and I think it's going to be discussed later, but it appears that an immune response to enzyme replacement therapy is sometimes a problem in why patients don't respond as well. We now know that there is a disturbance of a process going on inside cells which is called autophagy. This is the recycling of in the components inside a cell that uh, is necessary for normal cellular physiology. And I've drawn, I'm showing you a little picture of what autophagy is. You have to imagine that this is, that. If that's one autophagosome, then the cell in which this is occurring is at least the size of this room, if not much, maybe perhaps the size of the hotel. These are tiny, tiny things going on inside of every cell. And this is an, a membrane which comes along and takes a bite of the interior of the cell and delivers it to the lysosome for digestion and recycling. And then if you uh, look at this process a little bit more, you actually will recognize that the autophagosome is this recycling truck that goes around the cell collecting worn out parts of the cell. It delivers them to the lysosome. It fuses with the lysosome and then the digestion actually takes place in the lysosome. So these are two kinds of vesicles within the cell that get together and perform a very important process. So we now know from observations in patients and in biopsies and in mouse models that there is disturbed autophagy in patients. It's a secondary consequence of the lysosomal storage. And it is, uh, appears to be the major disturbance in patients of, who have late onset disease. But it also seems to be occurring in some infants after prolonged enzyme replacement therapy. And the consequence of that disturbance is ineffective recycling of worn out proteins in the cell. The development, I'm sure this will be touched on later, development of growing accumulations of cellular debris, including of lysosomes, in the middle of muscle cells. And the delivery of enzyme replacement therapy that ends up in these areas of cellular debris rather than where it should end up. And finally, the consequence of impaired muscular contraction as a consequence of the accumulation. So what are the treatment targets that are now in play? What are people working on? What are their ideas? Where do they stand? This will be a quick run through of things that I think will be covered, at least some of them, later in the program making better enzyme. So 
what the enzyme and enzyme replacement therapy is made uh, not in not in human beings, but it's made in the factory, and it's made by processes which are an attempt to replicate what actually goes on inside a cell, a human cell, as closely as possible. But part of the problem is to get the right hooks on the outside of the enzyme so that they will bind properly to the muscle cells. And uh, a lot of work has gone in, I think primarily by Genzyme at the moment, to make better enzyme, better hooks on the enzyme. Uh, the enzyme uh, is, is the, the latest version of it is in, in, in a testing stage, and I think there are other people who are perhaps other companies that are trying to make better enzyme as well. Trying to get more receptors on the surface of muscle cells. This is a rather new idea, and it's an interesting idea, and it's beginning to be worked on. Trying to force the patient's own enzyme, which is an imperfect enzyme, to be able to be delivered to lysosomes where whatever action it has may, may take place. It, um, this doesn't work for all, shouldn't work for all enzymes because sometimes the enzyme is per se defective, but sometimes it's merely defective in its ability to reach the lysosome. And so there has been work by, primarily by the amicus company to develop what are called chaperones to help get enzyme better to lysosomes. There's been an, a one trial in patients for that, and it, it has not yet been successful. The process of getting enzyme and uh, autophagosomes and endosomes and lysosomes, these are the vesicles that must come together in order to have effective enzyme replacement therapy. The, that series of movements of particles around cells, touching, fusion, delivery. That's a very complicated series of steps, and it really is not fully understood, and a great deal more basic research is needed to understand what the trafficking is that, that drives these elements to come to the right place at the right time, and it's not really ready for therapeutic <laughs> intervention at the moment. I just wanted to remind you that the autophagic machinery is really a delivery of debris to lysosomes where it's supposed to be digested and there's something wrong with that. The next big area that's been worked on in several ways is glycogen synthesis. Now the problem of this illness primarily is an inability to digest glycogen and if you didn't have glycogen to digest then lysosomes wouldn't accumulate gly glycogen and there have been a number of methods tried to block the delivery of glycogen to lysosomes. One of them is genetically in mice to block the production of glycogen and it's a, a more of a story than I want to tell except to say that it is a very promising method, but the particular mouse model has a problem, which is that many of the uh, newborn mice cannot survive being without glycogen synthesis. And uh, that takes us down another alley, which I'm not going to pursue. Another thing is to block the synthesis of glycogen pharmacologically. And uh, Rod Moreland at the Genzyme Company had the interesting idea of trying to block one of the enzymes that helps make the enzyme that makes glycogen. And uh, he chose a drug, rapamycin, and he has an interesting paper on it. The, tr the problem really is not, not that it's not a good idea, it is a good idea, but the drug itself has side effects which are, I think are probably uh, make it beyond being ever used in humans for this reason. And so I think that Dr. Moreland's laboratory is interested in finding other drugs which can intervene in making glycogen. 
And then the most interesting thing to me is a brand new observation by a very excellent glycogen biochemist named Peter Roach in how, how glycogen ever enters a lysosome. And he has discovered a protein called STDB1, which is necessary for, appears to be necessary for glycogen to enter the lysosome. And so it's as a brand new possible target for intervention to keep glycogen out of lysosomes. And then uh, a terrifically exciting new paper, which just came out within the last month, by a group in uh, a group at NIH and then a group in Italy, doing the following. This is now going. This is now showing you a cell, and the little dots in the upper left cell are lysosomes, forcing the lysosomes to move their move themselves or be moved to the inside surface of that cell for the membrane of the lysosome to touch the membrane of the cell and then to be expelled out of the cell. There is a, a protein called uh, transforming factor EB, uh, which does just that in cells. And they have found, they have discovered that if they put more TFEB into cells, they can get lysosomes to be expelled. And those of you who want to take on reading this very interesting paper, um, it just came out in a, paper, a journal called Developmental Cell, but it really is the germ of a very good idea. I have to say, uh, Dr. Rabin and I are uh, just dying to do these experiments on muscle cells, and we um, aren't we, Nina, going to do them very soon. <laughs> yeah. um, another thing uh, is, uh, to return to autophagy is that uh, in, uh, in the NIH laboratory, uh, uh, Nina Rabin has had a terrific success in uh, uh, enzyme replacement therapy in mice in which she has altered autophagy, knocked out of autophagy. And that's a, something you can do genetically in a mouse. You can't do it in a human genetically. But you can at least think about how you might develop drugs that interfered with autophagy in the same way that was done on the mice. And I'm going to show you a couple of slides only just to give you an idea that, that autophagy is not merely this sort of nice little process of membranes forming around parts of the cell. But in order for that to happen, it takes dozens and dozens of very large and complicated proteins to do that. And uh, this is a slide of just a part of the process. Uh, these are, you know, about 20 proteins which we know are involved. And actually, um, there are many more. And, and if you, every week when you open a journal, you'll find a new one. And then this is to make the point that autophagy, which is the process that's down in the lower right-hand corner there, is actually the end of a long series of other processes which drive autophagy. And so th th this looks very complicated, and indeed it is very complicated, but it makes the point that if you're trying to block autophagy, you actually have many possible avenues to look at as places to block autophagy. And this is a big and interesting pharmaceutical task at the moment of great interest because it looks like blocking autophagy is a useful thing to do in the treatment of certain tumors. And finally, uh, there are experiments on altering cell metabolism, something called fiber type conversion. Their muscle cells come in different flavors, and some of the flavors are treated better with enzyme replacement than others. And there's been work done, again, in Dr. Raven's laboratory to shift the metabolism within muscle cells 
so that they become more responsive to therapy. There are some interesting results, not ready for prime time. Uh, a, an unusual idea, which is that it's well known that when you damage muscle, you recover with cells that are, may, you may recover with cells that are uh, um, much less affected by an illness. This has been true, studied in dystrophies, and it uh, is probably true in Pompe disease as well. The trouble is, it's very hard to imagine doing something to injure muscle cells in order to get them better. And as I said, could this pass an ethics committee? I'm not sure. Gene therapy is very much on many people's minds. Uh, research is very active in it, and uh, I think it's in our future, but it's certainly not ready for prime time. Thank you very much. see in the uh, next three presentations of what has been achieved in the past 12 years with the application of enzyme therapy and we have uh, three speakers. Um, the first will be uh, Dr. Priya Kishnani from Duke University in North Carolina and she will report about how it went with the infants. She is a pediatrician and then the uh, second presentation will be about the 12 years experience with adults and that will be presented by Dr. Uh, Anne van der Ploeg. She too is a pediatrician, but in our setting at the Erasmus University, uh, we, we have a kind of a, a, a lysosomal storage disease center, so the kids and the adults, uh, they mixed around. And then the uh, third presentation will be by um, Denise Kungur, she is a fellow um, at our institute in Rotterdam, and she will report uh, about results obtained from the IPA survey, where uh, patients were questioned about their condition. So the patients respond, and she has analyzed the results. So that will be the third presentation. Uh, meanwhile, did you get it all set up? All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, it really has been a privilege and an honor to be here today. Um, I think the last time we met here as a community was in 2006, and that year we were celebrating uh, the first approved therapy for Pompe disease. And uh, as Dr. Royza said, I am a pediatrician by training, but we do follow individuals across the spectrum. Uh, today my job is to tell you what happened in the last 12 years, where we are today, and what are the next steps. So I want to once again thank the houses for having this uh, wonderful conference. And want to first show you the 12-year-old um, with infantile Pompe disease, just to give you a perspective of where we are 12 years later. I'm Jason. I go to Glenwood Middle School in Glenwood, Iowa, and I like hanging out with my friends and going to our high school football games. And my favorite college team would have to be the Iowa Hawkeyes. And my second favorite college team would have to be whoever plays and wins against Iowa State University. <laughs> So just to put this in perspective that we have made a lot of progress, um, this is uh, one of the oldest survivors of infantile Pompe disease. Uh, this young man is here with us today and he actually participated in the first clinical trial of CHO cell um, RHGAA. I um, wanted to just give you a brief perspective on, of the timelines of, from pre-ERT to where we are today. So I think that just taking a snapshot in 2003, we didn't really even have uh, appropriate information on the infant natural history studies, and that was completed. In 2004, we had the launch of the Pompeii Registry. In 2005, we had the completion of the, the pivotal clinical trials in infants, which ultimately led to um, FDA approval of myozyme. The same year, we had a real breakthrough on blood testing for um, acid alpha glucosidase deficiency. So in the past, we were doing this on muscle and on skin fibroblasts. We now have the ability to do this on a simple blood spot. Uh, in 2005, there was also the development of a biomarker for monitoring Pompe disease, known as HEX4. 
2005, another major breakthrough, muscle fiber type, plays a role in the clinical response to ERT, work from the NIH and from Dr. Rabin. Autophagy, as was just discussed, as a part of the pathology of Pompe disease, it's not just an accumulation of glycogen. And then 2006, myozyme was approved by the EMEA and FDA. So since the approval, have we as a community been active and what are our next steps? And I'm just compressing this to what I think was important in the field for infantile Pompeii. So in 2007, there was the first newborn screening pilot which was successful in Taiwan. Dr. Chen will speak about that later on. The next step was the importance of CRIM in the treatment response to ERT. In 2007, the question of what's the appropriate dose of enzyme therapy, high dose versus high frequency, and a study for this was completed. In 2009, we embarked on immune tolerance studies to get an idea of can we really suppress the antibody response in individuals with Pompe disease. In 2011, we started learning more about the negative impact of high sustained antibody titers, and there's a lot more work that's ongoing. I'm just trying to encapsulate this here. So the pre-ERT era, just to put this in perspective of what our challenge was when we as a group tried to do the work, this is really um, a plot of showing that the median age of survival or the median time of lifespan of a child with infantile Pompe disease at that time was about less than a year of age. This little girl was eight months when this video was taken. She didn't really live very much longer after this video was taken. So just to tell you, this is the benchmark of the challenge, and let's see what progress we've made. The good news is really we've got a change in the natural history with several long-term survivors since the advent of ERT. We've learned a lot in terms of disease management insights as a scientific community, we published guidelines on how to diagnose and how to manage uh, Pompe disease. I think a, an important lesson we learned was that it has to be done as part of a multidiscipline team, that care has to be provided at centers with experience or working with centers with experience, and that the outcome can be really positively impacted by initial intensive and comprehensive care. And ERT is an important part, but it's not the only component to the overall care of the infant. So this is really how it works. With the parents and the care coordinator, I would say, at the middle of, of this, the most important people. And then the group of us all surrounding this that needs to make this happen. And so another lesson that we learned was that treatment initiation at various stages um, really impacts the outcome and so the importance of an early treatment is important. So this is an infant who was picked up and I still think this is already too late. This is a four month old infant but you can see has a lot of reserves still, is very involved. This is now the infant who's a young boy. Um, this is him at eight years of age. This is when you have a child who's identified in the more symptomatic stage. Started on therapy at age seven months. And you can see that when there's significant involvement, when one starts, we're already having difficulties. This is the young boy now. You can see that he has made some motor gains, but there still are significant limitations. And now this is the point of what we say, the point of no return or irreversible damage. Started at 18 months of age. And this is some time later. Sorry, some of these take a while to load. Close. So once again, to show that after a year of enzyme therapy, there was really not much of a response to therapy. So this slide really encapsulates the importance of early or pre-symptomatic management of infants with Pompe disease. And now, a decade later, we really do have a new emerging phenotype of the treated infantile patient. There is a cardiac phenotype. The wonderful news, the positive, is that there's a significant improvement in the cardiomyopathy an improvement of the cardiac function. 
the ability for these infants to now tolerate anesthesia, which in the past could really have been life-threatening. But there are emerging issues. There is a potential risk for development of arrhythmias in some of these surviving infants. So I think that the work is still ongoing and still caution has to be put. So these are the echo findings um, of a child, the heart findings. What you can appreciate is this is pre-ERT, where you can see a very thickened heart. And this is after a very short duration of ERT, where there's better pumping ability of the heart. cardiac function after one year of enzyme. So the function of the heart, the ability to contract, really improves just even after one year of enzyme replacement therapy. Another part is a way we monitor or the way we, we diagnose an infant with Pompe disease is the significant changes that we see on an EKG strip on the heart strip that we take on a baby with Pompe disease. This is pre-enzyme therapy and what you see is a very tall um, wave over there which tells us that there's significant hypertrophy of the heart and this is now after enzyme replacement therapy you can really see a normalization of the EKG in the infant's heart. What we've now seen is that there can be the development of arrhythmias and in fact this could be a big risk because children are now running doing many more activities but some of them have developed some scar tissue or there still is some remains of glycogen which can put them at risk for arrhythmias, so this needs to be monitored continuously. Another part is the musculoskeletal impact of ERT. I think Dr. Plotz spoke to it very eloquently. There seems to be more difficult targeting to the skeletal muscle. Whilst many of our infants have acquired motor skills, with new motor milestones, the ability to walk, the ability to run, to participate in sports, some are able to function with ambulatory devices, but there seems to be definitely a more limited response than the heart response, and thus one more lesson, an important lesson, is to start early. We do have an emerging phenotype. You can see that despite the response to therapy, we do have a persistence of facial weakness in many of the surviving children. We do see some evidence of neck flexor weakness in the infant, Good. So these are ambulatory children, but if you see, they do have some difficulty. The rest of this boy, if you see, you can miss it completely. There's some difficulty. And here you can see that we see this also in adults with Pompe disease. The next one is fatigue. They do have fatigue, and in the interest, you can see in the early part, the child does extremely well. And now, over time, there seems to be a fatigue. Another finding that we are seeing is small eye invo muscle involvement, um, including the upper lids of the eyes, what we call ptosis. So this is a girl after a year on therapy, this is her three years into enzyme therapy, and this is her five years of age. You can see a weakness of the eyelids. Another example. So it doesn't affect all individuals with Pompe disease, but we are starting to notice that there can be ptosis or, uh, or small muscle uh, involvement of the eyes. Another part, I think once again, that Dr. Plotz talked about is the development of fractures in infants with Pompe disease. <coughs> I think this has been more an issue with the children who are very um, immobile or who are non-ambulatory and over time we are seeing an improvement but a potential risk is as the child becomes very active um, they could actually have fractures on treatment not because the therapy isn't working but now because they've become so active and the bones have not kept up. So another component to the overall care of the child. A uh, hearing loss, I think this has been reported by the group in Netherlands, by Arns, that we are seeing some amount of sensory neural hearing loss in our surviving infants. Um, language and speech function in children with infantile Pompe disease, I think Dr. Jones will be speaking about this later today. What we have seen is a very characteristic involvement of them, and One, once again you can hear this. Two, three, four. Good. Four years old. Four years old, very good, okay. 
I want you to say some sentences for me, okay? Say for me, pat the puppy. Pat the puppy. Very good. And say for me, bye baby a bib. So I think here you can appreciate that there is a hypernasal quality to the voice. But now let's see a difference. Can you say hi, to, can you say hi Dr. Kishnani? Dr. Kishnani? Yeah, Dr. Kishnani. So here's an infant who was started on therapy at two weeks of age, and you can see a real change or a real difference in the quality of the voice. Mm -hmm. Um, so the earlier impact or the earlier um, onset of treatment, I think, makes a difference. We are seeing some amount of swallowing dysfunction in children with Pompe disease. I think the good news is that this improves over time. Once again, a topic that will be covered by Dr. Jones. <laughs> I think a very important question that's coming about is the cognition in children with Pompe disease and how they are doing functionally. And so I think this is important to mention that we did a study looking at the cognitive development of infants who were started on enzyme therapy and what was going on with them one year into therapy. And then I'll talk about the older patients or the older children with Pompe disease. And I don't know why we're having this trouble. This has never happened before, so it's always the first time when you're doing a presentation. show you here is that the surviving infant is actually a very bright infant and they may have musculoskeletal issues and some cardiac issues um, but they are fairly bright at least as we see them today Harrison for that. Um, um, and so what we've seen is that the cognitive function of infants in the first 18 months of life um, have done extremely well. It's how we measure these cognitive outcomes. And what we learned is that those who had the high motor function tended to have a higher IQ score. Now is that really true? I think it's more the limitation of the measure of the IQ test rather than the ability of the child um, not doing well. So this is really showing you Another important part is that if we do not adjust, a number of our children are premature when they are started on enzyme replacement therapy. And when we're doing these IQ testing, if we don't correct for the gestational age, we tend to underestimate their clinical abilities. And this slide really is to show you that as once we corrected for it, they really were gaining, so to say, five to 10 IQ points. The second part is when we corrected really for their motor abilities, I want you to focus on the dark line on the top. This is now the functioning, the group of children who are able to walk. What you can see is their IQ is in the very normal range of functioning. The children with more motor disabilities or less motor abilities are the ones in the dotted line there. It doesn't mean that they're not doing well. I don't think we have appropriate tools to monitor these children. And now we've looked at the IQ in the long-term infantile survivors, and I just want you to focus on the extreme right. They're all functioning really in the average range of, 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 of intellectual abilities. So once again, using specific measures, for instance, the children who are not very verbal, we've got to use a different way of IQ measurement than someone who's verbal. And when we sort it out this way, uh, we find that they're, they're doing extremely well. How are they doing in terms of school placement? A number of them are in the classrooms. A number of them are getting speech and language therapy, getting occupational therapy, physical therapy, and other therapies. 
An important part I know in the US is having what we call an IEP in place, and this becomes an important component to the care of the child with Pompe disease. So once again, the holistic approach to care. We have children who are in fifth grade and in sixth grade and in regular classrooms. Of course, they are pulled out for certain special things like PE, but otherwise are completely main, main, mainstream. And so what are the lessons that we've learned and where are we today? What do you, we think are the next steps? I think it's already been brought out uh, numerous times is that extent of glycogen clearance really depends on the condition of the muscle tissue prior to treatment. So for instance, if you start a child early where there's less muscle damage, I think we can have an earlier impact and more efficient glycogen clearance than someone who's more involved at the outset or there's more muscle damage where it's very difficult then to get the impact of uh, therapy. <coughs> Another part is earlier treatment. I think Dr. Chen is going to speak about the newborn screening results in Taiwan. The, the next is, have we understood the pathology of Pompe disease completely? I think Dr. Rabin's talk will focus on this later on. Is there is a differential buildup of um, autophagic vacuoles in type 1 versus type 2 muscle fibers? So does it mean that if someone has more of type 1 versus type 2 fibers that the outcome is going to be different? I think, yes, there is going to be a differential accumulation and a differential clearance. We are seeing this now in the infants. We are also seeing it in the adults on muscle biopsies that there is the accumulation of autophagic vacuoles. Another part is the role of antibodies. I think we've learned and we've come a long way. There is a small subset of infants um, who are what we call cross-reactive immunological material negative. I'll be speaking to this more tomorrow. Um, these infants actually um, do not do very well on enzyme therapy because of the um, increasing titers that we are seeing in them um, and a clear separation. And these are the long-term infantile survivors. One common theme that we've seen, and there are many, many others, early start to therapy, all of them have been crim positive. All of them have made antibody titers, but then have tolerized over time. So I think there are certain factors that are starting to emerge. And I'm sure in the next decade, we learn more about muscle fiber type predominance, role of autophagy, and extent of glycogen clearance. I think another question is, what is the appropriate dose of enzyme replacement therapy? Is 20 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks appropriate? Are we really targeting skeletal mus muscle as efficiently as we would like? This is really showing you a young man before the start of enzyme therapy. I just want you to focus on his eyes. And you can see he's got a little bit of sun setting of the eyes there. And you see him now after the start of enzyme replacement therapy. You can see that there's a persistence weakness of the eyelids. And this is on the standard 20 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. And this is him now when we've increased the dose of enzyme replacement therapy to 40 milligrams per kilogram every other week. So clearly, there is a change, and there is a dose response. Now, does it mean that every child needs 40 milligrams per kilogram? I don't think we are very clear here, but I think one has to individualize care based on the needs of that infant. The other part that I think Dr. Plotz talked about, and tomorrow Dr. Kobel will speak about more, is are there better ways to deliver the enzyme to the skeletal muscle? And so I just leave this as a thinking point because we are working through this. And I think our ultimate goal is improving the prognosis by newborn screening and early treatment. This is wonderful work from Taiwan. And the data there really showed that results indicate that early treatment can benefit infants with Pompe disease and highlights the advantages of an early diagnosis, which can be achieved via newborn screening. And here you can see a baby started at 14 days of age. This is him at two years. And you can see that he has very subtle uh, challenges. He's doing extremely well, once again showing the impact of early oh, okay. enzyme replacement therapy. Control again, okay. And now the use of adaptive equipment and exercise. We have to be doing this today. We cannot just be working with enzyme therapy. So this is showing you adaptive equipment over time. And can our children be on a treadmill? Sure they can. You are doing a wonderful job on that treadmill. And so there is a role for exercise. 
And so in conclusion, really, we have made significant progress in the 12 years with a dramatic change in the natural history of Pompeii. I think our challenges are that we've got a new natural history that's emerging. This patient subpopulation tends to manifest a constellation of distinct clinical findings, I would say distinct even from the adults. Cognition up to this point appears to be intact. A multidiscipline approach is needed. There is definitely the role for adjunct therapies, good nutrition, exercise, additional pharmacotherapies. I think newborn screening is an important next step. And this is our gratitude to our children who've really made this day happen today. The ability to go to school, the ability to run, the ability to participate in Halloween and be doctor, the ability to celebrate a first birthday, the ability to blow, to blow their candles on their birthdays. And I've come to the end, but I want to Click show on the you. Cross. Click on the cross. Yep, and I'm going to sh end this with a movie that uh, we did as a dedication to the patients and our children. And I apologize for this, I didn't do this before. <laughs> Once you see this movie, you'll, ex you'll excuse me for these technical glitches that we've had today. So I have to apologize, I think trying to get this movie crashed the computer four or five times, but I think this spoke for itself of our, our success over the last 12 years. Um, and I just want to point out that this music is actually um, 
Indian music and it's just that we are a blending culture sung by a Western artist just to say that we are all one big family of East meeting West and making brilliant music. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priya. It was a very nice, beautiful videotape. And I think it goes very well uh, to, our, to my uh, own presentation. I think, um, thank you very much that I uh, am allowed to speak here today. And I'm always very happy to be here with the patients because I think it's you, the patients, where it's all about. Um, Priya just showed that we had a lot achieved over the last few years, but there are also a lot of challenges yet, but I hope that these uh, will be overcome someday. I would like to start with the uh, AMDA meeting. Um, we are here in the friendly environment, and uh, I show you here a picture of the AMDA meeting on the left. I'm here with Nina Robin and the organizers uh, the House family, uh, Randall House, and I'm very happy that today Tiffany is uh, organizing this meeting, and Tiffany, I would like to congratulate you. It's a terrific meeting, and you did a very good job. I would like to start uh, to introduce ourselves with you to the very nice presentation of Kevin, and thank you Kevin for the very nice words. I hardly need to do it, but um, on the top you see uh, Arnold Dreiser and myself, and uh, you can imagine that it's really uh, a piece of joy to be next to the Master of Ceremonies day by day. And I would like to introduce also the other people of the team that are here today, because I thought maybe you want to ask questions and then we are always free to uh, answer your questions. There's Denise Gemger. She will give a lecture after me about survival. She's a PhD uh, working with us, and she is involved in the IPA survey. It's very important that you answer all those surveys because it gives us a lot of information. And then there is Linda van der Berg. She is an MD, also a PhD with us, and a movement scientist, and she will talk about exercise, Gerard Wagenmaker is a professor in hematology, and he will talk about gene therapy, and he works together with Meryl Stock, who is also here in the audience, and has done a lot of the work. I thought maybe you're not aware, because there are always new people in, in the room, and uh, I noticed it yesterday during dinner, but you, to the words of Kevin, we, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's known already. We had a long history in, uh, in research in pompous disease, and uh, here on top is the thesis of Arnold, and this is my thesis, and here are all the theses that were produced at Erasmus, and important milestones from cloning to the gene to the first clinical trial in 1999. And this first clinical trial, and then what I would like to do is give you a short introduction about what has been done, especially in the, uh, in the late onset patient population, and after that, I would like to give you a short update how um, we progress with the patients in the Netherlands to give you some idea where we are with prognostic factors. So in 1999, we started the first clinical trial, and indeed, a lot was achieved. And now, um, the oldest patients are 12 years old, and three of these patients are still alive. But it also has put us to the challenges, and you just heard it. Um, that it is very important to start the treatment very early. Once you've lost all your muscle strength, it's very difficult to recover your muscle. Then, in this same period we started, because we, at that time it was unknown what would the therapy bring, we decided to do two things. We started with four infants, but also to include three older patients, two children and one adult in this initial trial because we want to know maybe are these the patients that may benefit the most in the end. And there, in fact, we came to the same conclusion, that it was very important to start the treatment early. What, what you see on the left is here a patient who was untreated at the age of 12. At the age of 16 years, she became ventilator dependent, 
And finally, at the age of 32, he started uh, enzyme replacement therapy, but at that time he was completely paralyzed. And the difference that we saw over 12 years for the patients on the right, who has had some milder symptoms, who was able to take some support on his legs, and who is currently at the age of 23 able to, uh, to walk and run, is a, is a huge difference. But that doesn't mean that we didn't bring anything for the patients who are completely ventilator dependent. And because I would like to say that this patient is now 44 years old. And last year I was doing my sh Christmas shoppings at the garden center. And suddenly I ran into this patient and he was there with his wife and his, uh, his uh, girl and uh, uh, his, uh, his child. And, uh, now, and, and we had a little chat and that simply was, think uh, was something that was not possible when he started the therapy, then he was bedridden for most of the day. But this was also reason to start a trial in 2005 in five children who were ambulant because probably these patients would benefit most from the therapy. And we started together with Genzyme to do a trial in five patients aged 6 to 15 years uh, old. And these patients were all able to walk. And there was one patient who was ventilator dependent during the night. And what we saw in this trial was that uh, the patients showed an increase in muscle strength. And what you can see here in this slide, I will show you. Here is the muscle strength on the vertical axis. And here on the horizontal axis, you see the age of the patients. And what you see here, the different colors are the different patients. And that all patients showed an increase in muscle strength. But what you can also notice is here, these are the reference values for normal girls and normal boys that although the muscle strength increased, it did not completely normalize. When we looked at the pulmonary function in these patients, and you have to look here, here's the percentage pulmonary function, 100% is maximum, and in the five patients treated over three years of therapy, then what we found is that over three years of therapy, the pulmonary function stabilized or slightly improved, and this was both the case in sitting position, this on the left, and on the right in the supine position, so when patients are laying down. And then we wondered what would have happened. We thought this is, in, in principle, a good result because these patients did not deteriorate over time. But then the problem was, what is happening to more normal children with pompous disease? How does the disease progress over time? And then we realized that this information is not, was not available. So what we did is we looked in our own charts and we looked in, into patients that we have seen in the past and we selected those patients who had a decreased pulmonary function at start, at, at first visit, and then we looked over time and what we found in these patients, these untreated patients, that if you did nothing, that you found a decline uh, of 5% uh, per year. And that was significantly different than the patients who were treated. And you see that she has very much difficult in getting up while two years after start of treatment she is doing it very quickly and vividly. So here she completed the job at 26 weeks and at baseline it was impossible. And at the end I said it's okay you can use your arms and then she's doing it. At that time she was 30 years old and here she is at 18 years old. And what you can see that she still has some difficulties in raising her head and that she now needs her arms to get in an upright position but still she's doing rather well the pulmonary function has stabilized over time and she's a very beautiful lady at 18 years age so, so the next uh, challenge was what is happening with the adults and I think the most important trial performed so far uh, is the uh, LOT study, what we call the LOT study, the Late Onset Treatment Study. And that is a study that was started in 2006, 2007, and was published in the New England Journal in 2010. And that's a trial, maybe some of you participated in this trial because it was a multi-center trial. Five centers from the U.S. participated in the trial, and in fact most of the patients came from the U.S., and we also participated in this uh, trial. Uh, as European Center together with parents. 
In total, 90 patients were included, and these were divided in two groups. 60 patients received the enzyme, and 30 patients received placebo. That means no myosin, but something sold. Um, what was investigated is uh, the primary endpoints. How far can a patient walk during six minutes? Um, that was one of the primary endpoints, and to see how it evaluates over time. And then the pulmonary function in sitting position. And they also took other endpoints, looked at muscle strength and the maximum inspiratory pressure how, uh, and, and expiratory pressure. Patients received 20 milligram per kilogram of myosine every other week and efficacy assessments were performed every 12 weeks, so every three months. Patients had to, be, uh, had to have an age over eight years old, and they had an FEC of more than 30% and less than 80%. They were not allowed to be ventilator dependent during the day, and they had to be able to walk at least 40 meters. So all patients were ambulant. So and this is what the results are, and these are the results over 78 weeks of treatment. And here you see the change in mean distance walk on the vertical axis. And the green line is, are the results of the patients who received myosin. And what you can see then is that the patient who received myosin walked more meters at the end of the trial. And these are the patients who did not receive myosin, so the placebo. And the difference at the end of 78 weeks of treatment was 28 meters. The same was done for the FEC, for the pulmonary function. And there again, green is the myosin group. And what you can see here over time is the mean change in percentage predicted FEC, forced vital capacity. And what you can see is that uh, the, uh, this is the myosin group, this is the placebo group, that there is a significant difference between the two groups of 3.4% over 78 weeks. And what was concluded is that more or less the myosin group stabilized in pulmonary function and that the placebo group deteriorated. What was also investigated, uh, and this is a little complicated slide, whether these patients formed antibodies. So these patients think uh, this protein is not mine, I make an antibody, so I don't want it. And then you find it tighter if that happens. And what was found that may occur, in, in especially in some of the uh, infants, and what was found is that in, generally, in general, that adults do not make a lot of antibodies. But there may be exceptions, and there's one exception shown in this slide, and I have to help you a little, is what is shown here in this patient is the distance walked here on the right side and that are the black dots, and you see initially this patient is doing well, is increasing in walking distance, but then here you see the white blocks, he is developing antibodies, and his distance walk decreases. So here the antibodies have a negative effect on the performance of the patients. And this patient formed very, this very unusual high antibody titers that's also found, for example, in some of the infants. So the conclusion of this LOTS trial was that there was a significant difference between the group of patients that received the enzyme, myozyme, and the group of patients that received placebo after 78 weeks in distance walked during six minutes and in the FSC, the force vital capacity in sitting position. But what was also shown is was that, there, that not all patients responded the same. There was variation in response, and that was not all only found in the LOT study, but also by other colleagues. Here you see Italian colleagues and German colleagues also found that there was variation in response. And what I would like to do in the next part, I would like to show you some of these uh, of our data to see whether we could find some prognostic factors for who are the good responders, who are the bad responders, still preliminary. And in Rotterdam we have quite a lot of patients, about 140 patients, and we have infantile patients, children, but the majority of patients are adults with the disease. And I would like to present uh, the data on 71 of these patients. And the aim of the study was to study the effect of enzyme therapy in adults and in all the adults, not only those in, in the LOTS, but also the severely affected and also the more mildly affected, and to look at potential prognostic factors. 
Of course, uh, it were adults, so all had to have an age over 18 years of age. And uh, they had to have symptoms of muscle weakness, so <laughs> the, uh, uh, and the FEC, the pulmonary function, and or, so it, it was either either. They had uh, weak, uh, they had muscle weakness and or a decreased pulmonary function. And of course, they had to have pompous disease. And it had to be determined by enzyme diagnosis and mutation analysis. Patients received a dose of 20 milligram per kilogram every other week. And this is the study group I mentioned. There are 71 patients. And in, during the trial, in the beginning of the trial, two patients died. Uh, one uh, was a female of 61 years old who had an uh, aneurysm of the aortic that might be related to pompous disease. That's not completely clear. And in other patients was very severely affected and he was not very motivated. So after four months of uh, therapy, he said, I don't want to do it anymore. And he was severely affected and died eventually six months later. So 69 patients uh, remained in this, uh, in this trial and uh, were included in the analysis. And from 51 of these patients, we also had data before they started therapy. So in the period that they didn't receive it yet, and we could follow part of the natural cause of the disease. And in 18 patients on the right, this was not the case. We only had data from start of enzyme therapy. Is that clear to everybody? Yeah? Okay, we go ahead. So if you looked at the total group of uh, patients, the 69 patients, we had uh, data of a mean follow-up of 23 months, about two years. And you see between brackets the range from six months to four years. And we looked at the, um, if we look at the group of patients from which we have pre-treatment data and post-treatment data, then we had a period that they were not treated, was uh, a mean of 16 months and ranging from two months to 33 months, so about three years. And the mean duration that they received therapy was two years. So this is the group of patients of the total 69, and what you can see is that there are an equal number of males and females in the trial, and that most of the patients had the most common mutation that is occurring in the, in the, in the patients with uh, a late onset form of the disease. Probably you are aware of this mutation, and this mutation gives rise to 10 to 20 percent residual alpha glucosidase activity, so that explains why the course is uh, m less severe than in the infants. The age at first complaints in these patients was uh, 30 years, and the age of diagnosis 40, and finally when they started to have therapy it was 52 years. And what you can see that is there is still a large gap between when the first symptoms are found and when patients eventually get started on treatment. Um, if you look at the walking devices, you can see it here, that 75% of the patients used walking devices and 27% of these were fully ventilate, uh, wheelchair dependent, and also a lot of patients used uh, ventilators. So what did we take as parameters of evaluation? It was muscle strength, and why did we use muscle strength? Because you can measure that in all the patients, also those patients who are not able to walk. And we did it via two methods, via handheld dynamometry, that you measure the force, and there is a special scale developed, it's called the MRC score, and you can grade how strong the muscles are. And we also did it with a special device, I will just show you where you can measure the, st the strength in Newton. Newton. And further we measured pulmonary function, in sitting position, and in supine position, because you're probably aware that in pompous disease, especially the diaphragm is, infected, uh, is affected, and that means that there, in most adults there is a difference between the pulmonary function in sitting position and in supine position. And that's also the reason why you need sometimes a ventilator during night when you're asleep. <laughs> Patients were assessed before start of treatment every six months and after start of treatment every three months. And this is, uh, these were the muscles that were tested with the handheld anemometry. You see the device, you put it here and then you measure the strength. And in total, the strength was measured of 16 muscle groups of the neck flexors, the neck extensors, the shoulder adductors, so it's this, what you do it like this, and then you have the elbow flexors, the extensors, and the hip flexors and extensors, and the knee flexors and extensors. And with the handheld oh, dynamometry, of, with the MRC score, so when you measure it with, with hand, we could add 
some extra muscle groups, and these are underlined here. In total, uh, five of the 69 patients withdrew from the study, and in three patients this was because of the fact that they developed infusion-associated reactions, and two patients died during the course of therapy. One patient, uh, both were severely affected, one patient died at 50 years of age, uh, due to a sepsis and severe decubitus, and the uh, second patient died at 77 years of age because of respiratory failure 33 months after start of therapy. So now we come to the results, and I will help you through this slide. If we look at the MRC sum score, so that is the strength measured by hand, then we found that there was an increase in the group of 69 patients of 1.4% per year, and this is the range. And this was highly significant. A p-value of less than 0 0.5 is significant, and this was highly significant. And you see that a lot of measurements were done, more than 500 in these patients' group. And with handheld dynamometry, we found an increase of 4%, again highly significant, and again a large number of measurements. And we found that all muscle groups responded well to therapy. And then the effect on the pulmonary function, the forced vital capacity. Here the same graph, and I go now to the FEC, the forced vital capacity, and what we found there is that the FEC stabilized. There was no change over time. Again, a large number of measurements, and an FEC supine, so in supine position when you're laying down, we found a decline, so we were, were a little worried, and this was also significant. So in the next set of experiments, we, uh, or analysis, we wanted to know how does it change over time? What was it before, and what is it after start of therapy? And here, the vertical line in the middle, here, is, the is where the patient started to receive enzyme therapy. Is that clear? So what we found, if we looked at the muscle, muscle strength measured by hand, that before start of therapy, there was a decline of 1.2% per year, and after start of therapy, there was an increase of 2.1% per year. And if you look at the change, there was a net effect of 3.3% per year. So that's a positive effect. The same we found for the handheld dynamometry with the device. Before start of therapy, a decline of 2.8% per year. And after start of therapy, an increase of 5% per year. And again, there was a significant change and now the net effect was 8% per year, so also a good result. If you look at the pulmonary function, before start of therapy there was a decline of 2%, and in fact that is completely comparable with what we found in the LOT study and in other study, where they found about 1.7% per year, so 2.2% in 78 weeks, so that's quite the same. And after start of therapy it leveled off, and uh, the there was uh, an increase of 0.2% per year, so it's more or less stable. And there was a change of 1.8% per year, but this was borderline significant. So there is a change over time. But if you look at the FEC in supine position, there was a decline before start of therapy, 1.8% per year, and after start of therapy, it was a little bit less, 1% uh, per year. There was a change of 0.8% per year, but this was not significant. So in the next uh, question, the next question we asked was, is this, uh, what are now the good responders and what are the get bad responders? Can we find some factors that might play a role in defining whether these patients have a good response? And what we did is the following. We uh, divided the group of patients in, uh, in <laughs> subgroups, and what we did is, if the patient had, and I don't see my cursor, it's over here. This is the course before start of therapy, and if the course after start of therapy is the same or worse, we called it non-responders. And was the course better, we called it responders, and we split them in two, in moderate responders and in good responders. Is that clear? Yeah? Okay. So, and this is what we found. And then what we found is that patients responded well on muscle strength, but that's also what you found, and that there were only six patients from uh, the 69 that did not respond uh, on an MSC score. And half were good responders, and half were moderate responders. 
If we looked at the FEC in sitting position, we found that 84% were responders and that nine of the patients did not respond. And if we looked at the FEC in supine position, there were 61% responders and 39% of the patients who did not respond. So in the next question, we asked what are now what are the patients who have the positive response? And we did a kind of subgroup analysis. And we used the following subgroup. We looked at gender. Uh, is it a male or a female? Is, a, is it age, less than 45 years, more than 45 years? Disease duration, shorter disease duration, less than 15 years, or longer disease duration, more than 50 years? Did he use a wheelchair or not? Uh, what was the MRC sum score? What, what, did he use a mechanical ventilation, yes or no? And uh, what was the FEC in upright position, less than 80% or more than 80%? And then we found the following, that if we looked at muscle strength, that females responded significantly better than males. And we do not have a good explanation. It might be that uh, uh, men have a higher muscle mass and maybe the fibers are also bigger and maybe there are mi less men know six phosphate uh, receptors per area on this muscle si fiber, we don't know exactly. And it was indeed the case that five of the six non-responders were male. If we looked at pulmonary function, good responders were in supine position. The younger ones, the ones, uh, they were 40 compared to 52 for the rest of the group. The median MRC score was higher. The FEC was higher, so the pulmonary function was higher, 81% versus 67%. And none of these patients was ventilator dependent. So, in conclusion, we can say that enzyme therapy alters the natural cause of pompous disease. Uh, muscle strength increases uh, via, uh, by ERT and uh, pulmonary function in sitting position stabilized Prognostic factors for the good response are for muscle strength, female gender, and for pulmonary function in supine position, a younger age, and a better clinical condition. Of course, there's still a lot of work to do, and this is a first analysis that we did, and we did it on a group basis, so it's not really uh, something that you can use completely for yourself and say, on an individual basis, this is how it goes, because there is variation. And one of the challenges for the future is to get a better understanding of the response and get a better understanding of these prognostic factors, check it in larger groups of patients, but it is a start towards understanding the prognostic factors. And it can also help us to improve the therapy. Maybe are the patients who respond less the ones who need a higher dose, or the ones who need innovative therapies. We need a better understanding of the role of antibodies and uh, also can help the most efficient targeting to the muscles. How do you get most efficient in the muscles? It was mentioned before. And also we have always, we have to look for better and more optimal treatment of patients. And in fact, that's what we do on a day by day basis. Look at uh, better potential supportive <laughs> measures, also training, what Linda will talk about, can also help to improve the effect. But I think I want to end with a very positive message and that definitely is the case that ERT has changed the perspective uh, for patients and I think the living proof of this is uh, the chairman of our meeting today and uh, I hope there's still a lot to follow. I hope it is a positive message that I could bring but you uh, also, uh, will also understand that there are still challenges ahead. And I would like to thank all the people who worked with us from our team. And of course, the patients and the families, we can't do anything without the help of the patients and the families. Only the patients can tell, them, can tell us about the disease and what the therapy does for them. And I would also like to mention that the two persons on the top, Juna de Vries and Nadine van der Beek, who are physicians, PhD students in neurology and uh, who are, did a lot of the work in the adults. Thank you very much.